Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the uh, London Hand and Wrist course. Uh, I want to thank uh, orthopedic principals and say hello to all our um, viewers in India as well. So over the course of the day, we're going to be covering all things hand and wrist. So I want you guys to use it as an opportunity to really sort of develop your knowledge of hand and wrist, get a good understanding of what needs to be known for the exam, but also don't feel scared to ask any questions, no matter how minor. The aim is that you leave today with a full knowledge of what to pass for the exam. So when looking at biomechanics of the hand and wrist, I immediately see people's eyes starting to glaze over and I see that sort of sense of trepidation and fear. But my advice is, before you can understand what goes wrong, you have to understand what goes right first. So you have a knowledge base to work back from if you ever get into a panic in the exam. So I'm gonna keep it really simple. And I look at biomechanics on two levels. I look at the level of the fingers or digits and the wrist and carpus. Okay, so in terms of the fingers, just think that there's two motors, okay, and three joints. The interphalangeal joints, the metacarpophalangeal joints, and the carpometacarpal joints. So two motors, three joints. Okay, so let's start with those joints. So you've got the interphalangeal joints, all right? So these are simple joints. They're hinge joints similar to the knee, and they basically have one plane of motion, flexion and extension. And that's the distal and proximal interphalangeal joints. Next, we've got the metacarpophalangeal joints. And these essentially have two axes of movements. They're ellipsoid joints. So as well as flexion and extension, they also allow abduction and adduction. So just remember that, two axes of movement, ellipsoid joints. And then finally, the carpometacarpal joints. Again, two axes of movements, and these behave as saddle joints, flexion, extension, abduction, adduction. okay? So remember that, hinge joints, ellipsoid joints, and saddle joints. One axis, two axis, two axis. That's what you're gonna remember for the exam. So we then go on to the motors. Remember I said there's three joints, two motors, and these are motors which control your movement. And I break these up into the extrinsics and the intrinsics. And your extrinsics are the extensors and flexors. And I think of these as the movements which give you power. Whereas the intrinsics are more important for your fine tuning. So doing those sort of fine movements. So I'm keeping it very simple, very basic, but that's how I want you to remember it for the exam. So let's start with the extrinsics. And as I said, it's flexors and extensors. The extensors are the first part, and you will need to know about the basic extensor mechanism for the exam. So the way that I think about it is, the extensor mechanism starts over the proximal phalanx and it brings, it picks up contributions from the lumbricals and interossei on the radial side to form this thing called an extensor hood. Okay, that extensor hood then basically splits to form a central slip, which inserts into the middle phalanx and extends the PIP joint and two lateral bands which then will insert as a terminal extensor tendon into the distal phalanx and extend the DIP joint. Okay, so you've got that extensor hood, central slip, lateral bands. That's what buzzwords I want you to remember for the exam, okay? And what are these things here, the sagittal bands? Well, these are important because I call these the locators. They keep the extensor mechanism in place when you bend your finger or when you flex your finger, okay? So, if you get, for example, sagittal band ruptures, which we see in rheumatoid arthritis commonly, and they bring these up in the exam, you might get dislocation of that extensor mechanism into the gutter. And the way that you can test for that clinically, sagittal band rupture, is you can passively try and relocate the finger. So passively extend the finger and see if they're able to maintain that position. If so, that means that it's a sagittal band rupture rather than a true extensor tendon rupture, okay? So remember those four buzzwords, extensor hood, central slip, lateral bands, and sagittal bands, okay? Those are the four parts of the extensor mechanism I want you to discuss in the exam. And one thing you'll learn from me is I love signposting. I love giving bullets to the examiner, little signposts, okay? So that's the four things I want you to remember going into the exam, those bullets. The next part is this buzzword called retinacular ligaments. And what do the retinacular ligaments do? Well, they also help to function to keep the extensor mechanism 
in particular the lateral bands in place during flexion and extension of the finger. And there's three retinacular ligaments that I want you to remember for the exam. The first one is the triangular retinacular ligament, this one that you see here. The triangular ligament prevents volar subluxation of the lateral bands, and it's commonly injured, attritional injury, in a boutonnier's deformity. And I'll come on to that in a second, but just remember that triangular ligament goes in boutonnier's deformity. The next one is the transverse retinacular ligament. And the transverse retinacular ligament, this time, stops the lateral bands from going dorsal. Okay? So it prevents dorsal subluxation of the lateral bands. And basically, that gets injured in swan neck. Okay? So triangular prevents volar subluxation, gets injured in boutonniers. Transverse prevents dorsal subluxation, gets injured in swan neck. That's what I want you to remember. And the final one to remember is this thing called the oblique retinacular ligament. It's kind of like a diagonal retinacular ligament. A sort of other name that we sometimes use for it is the ligament of Landsmeyer. Okay. And this functions as a kind of connecting line between the PIP joint and DIP joint motion. So when you flex the PIP joint, the ligament will relax to allow DIP joint flexion. When you extend the PIP joint, the ligament will tense and that will automatically allow DIP joint extension. Okay, so just imagine it's a communicator between PIP joint and DIP joint motion. So those are the three retinacular ligaments. The last one that I'm going to mention very briefly is this thing called the volar plate. And the volar plate, the way that I think of it is it's like a check rein. It's a thickening of a capsule which sits volar to the joint to prevent hyperextension of the joint. So you've got one over the MCP joint, you've got one over the PIP joint as well, okay? And that's important because if you get dislocations of the PIP joint or the MCP joint, particularly with a hyperextension injury, you've got to be careful that the volar plate can be injured and can sometimes sublux into the joint as well, okay? And that can prevent extension. We then move on to the flexor mechanism. And the flexor mechanism is a lot simpler. You think of it as FDS and FDP, okay? So the FDS tendon, guys, it splits at the proximal third of the proximal phalanx to form a gap, which is known as campus chiasm. The Latin word chiasm basically means a gap. And that then rotates around the FDP tendon, which basically passes through the chiasm and the FDS inserts into the middle phalanx and basically flexes the middle phalanx. Whereas the FDP, the two parts will go around and insert into the distal phalanx, extending the, sorry, flexing the DIP joint. Okay. So FDS flexes the middle phalanx, oh sorry, flexes the PIP joint. FDP flexes the DIP joint. That's the simple things to remember. Okay. What else do you need to know for the exam? You need to know that FDP is a mass action muscle. So the way that I think about it is FDP2, the FDP to the index finger is independent, but three, four, and five, you can think of that as a mass action muscle, muscle which means that one tendon will control lots of digits together and they will move as one. Okay, although FDP to the index will have an independent movement. Now, why is that important? Well, it's important because if one of those tendons to three, four, or five is shortened, for example, let's say you've injured your FDP tendon, it's been repaired, and as a surgeon, you repair one a little bit short, it means that all of those three, four, five tendons will be shortened. So they will never achieve full excursion. And that's known as a quadrigia effect. It's, it's sort of likened to a Roman charioteer where basically one person takes the reins and controls lots of horses. So that's the analogy you've got to think of in your mind. Okay. So FDP, mass action muscle. That's the take home message. Okay. So those are the extrinsics that I've talked about. So let's move on to the intrinsics. And these are responsible for your fine tuning movements. And I think of these as the lumbricals or interossei. So let's start with the lumbricals. The lumbricals, guys, are unique muscles because they originate from one tendon, the radial side of FDP, and they insert into another tendon, 
the radial part of the extensor hood. So they go from tendon to tendon. And the way to think of those is they're guy ropes. So they basically fine tune movements between flexors and extensors. That's what the lumbricals are, are responsible for. And they flex the MCP joint and extend the IP joints. Okay, that's important. All right. So in the exam, everybody goes on about, oh, EDC extends the IP joints. No, think of it as lumbricals and introsia is responsible for that. Okay, lumbricals specifically extend the IP joints. All right. EDC is responsible for the MCP joint. Okay, so that's an important point to know. There's things that people often get confused with. Let's move on to the introsii. The introsii, again, these guys will flex the MCP joint and they will extend the IP joints. Okay, they're not as strong extensors as the lumbricals. Okay, so the lumbricals are more powerful. Do any of you know why the lumbricals are more powerful than the introsii as extensors of the IP joints? So it's all to do with the central rotation. So the central rotation of the lumbricals is further away than the enterosei. So they have a longer lever arm. So they have a greater biomechanical advantage. Okay, so that's really important, guys. I know a few of you mentioned about intrinsic plus, intrinsic minus. Remember that in the back of your minds. The lumbricals and the enterosei extend the IP joints and they flex the MCP joints, but the lumbricals are more powerful because they've got a greater mechanical advantage. And the introsii also abduct and adduct the fingers, okay? So remember the mnemonic, pad and dab. Palmer, adduct, dorsal, abduct. Pad and dab, okay? I hope I'm making you interested in biomechanics now. Okay, good. So we're surgeons, all right? And at the end of the day, it's all very nice having a biomechanics lecture, but what you guys want to ask me, I hope is, well, Dr. Rishi, what is the actual relevance of biomechanics? And I like to say biomechanics in action. Let's put it into action and think of it in a practical point of view. Okay. And these are the three conditions that often come up in the exam. Intrinsic plus, intrinsic minus, and lumbrical plus. I'm going to go through those with the knowledge that we've talked about. So let's start with an intrinsic plus hand. And that's where you've got some sort of muscular imbalance between the intrinsics, the lumbricals and introsii, which become spastic, and the relatively weaker extrinsics, FDS, FDP, and EDC, okay? So if your intrinsics are more powerful than your extrinsics, bearing in mind what I've told you about the movements, what position will your hand be in? Yes, but you're going to get basically a flexed MCP joint and an extended IP joint. Does that make sense, guys? Because the intrinsics extend your IP joints and they flex the MCP joints. So think of it as a seesaw between the intrinsics and the extrinsics. The intrinsics are relatively spastic and more powerful. So you will get that thing. It's what we put people into in an Edinburgh position after we often do sort of finger repairs and injuries like that. Okay, so it's muscular imbalance and you get that classical positioning there. And there's various things that can cause it. So it can be caused by trauma. You can get it in rheumatoid arthritis. So trauma, for example, it could be direct, indirect. It could be a vascular injury. It could be compartment syndrome, rheumatoid arthritis. It could be somebody who's got an MCP joint dislocation, okay? And then basically ulnar deviation, and that causes the intrinsics to go into spasm and become sort of extra excited and then neurology for example cp or a stroke so on examination you get that classical appearance and the way you will test for this is what's the test for a intrinsic plus hand does anybody know yes it's called a bundles test okay so with a bundles test what are we doing mirage how do you do a bundles test so uh, basically uh Ideally, with fingers in uh, flexion, mm -hmm. the, if the intrinsic are working and both are controlled, we can still extend the MCP joint. Mm -hmm. But if the intrinsic are tied uh, with the wrist in or wrist in extension, we can't flex the MCP joint. Yeah. So exactly. So you guys might be asked now, and this is one thing to, to just as an aside, guys. In the new exam, because you often don't have patients because of COVID you might be asked to talk through clinical tests. So the way that I would talk through Bunnell's test is I would literally say, right, what you're doing is you're basically testing MCP joint extension and then, sorry, you're testing the PIP joint flexion with the MCP joints extended 
and then with the MCP joints flexed. And what you find is when you basically extend them, when you tighten up the intrinsics, you'll find that PIP joint flexion will reduce. And that is a positive Bunnell's test, which you can see here. MCP joints are extended, okay? MCP joints are flexed, okay? So you can see here, when they're flexed, the PIP joint will flex more. When they're extended, the PIP joint doesn't flex as much. So that's intrinsic tightness. We next move on to intrinsic minus or the more common claw hand that you see, okay? So this time, basically, it's an, it's an imbalance between the extrinsics, which are strong, and the relatively weaker intrinsics. So Sahail, bearing that in mind, if I told you the extrinsics are strong, the intrinsics are weak, what position will the hand be in? So then you get cleaning of the hands. You just describe that to me, though. Very good point. So guys, the biggest thing people say in the exam is they all go, oh, what's the claw hand? Everybody goes on about you get flexion of the IP joints, DIP joint, PIP joint. Everybody misses out that you get hyperextension of the MCP joints. So true clawing is also hyperextension of the MCP joints. Okay. So now I hope you guys, rather than learning this by route, you can work it out from what I've told you in the biomechanics. If you just remember my seesaw analogy, intrinsic plus, the intrinsics are more powerful than the extrinsics. Intrinsic minus, the extrinsics are more powerful. Then if you just work out what each of those does, you don't need to memorize this. That is the way that I would learn for the exam, especially part two. That is what they are testing. Okay, and what causes that? Well, just think of anything that can cause the intrinsics to become weak. So it could be a nerve palsy, ulnar nerve, medium palsy. We've seen it with those sort of low and high um, nerve palsies. A medium nerve, it could be Volkman's ischemic contracture. It could be leprosy, Hansen's disease. It could be a failure to splint following a intrinsic plus, following a crush injury. So that's why we split them in that intrinsic plus position. It could be a shark and marry tooth. It could be a compartment syndrome. So there's lots of different causes, okay? One question people say to me is, well, Rishi, okay, so why do they have a clawed position if EDC is still working? Why is it clawed if EDC is still working? The yeah, but it's, it's actually, the EDCs are actually not very significant at the IP joints. And that's why I wanted to, my point I said earlier, EDC acts mainly at the MCP joints. It has very little action at the IP joints. Okay. So that puts it into proof. So if they say to you, what's the main function of EDC, you would say it's an extender of the MCP joint. An example of this would be a claw hand because you would not expect clawing if it was a strong extensor of the IP joints. Does that make sense, guys? Okay, good. And again, a provocative test basically is if you bring the MCP joint out of hyperextension, the flexion deformity at the IP joint will correct. Okay, so how are you going to treat this? You can treat it by contracture release and also a passive tenodesis or active tendon transfer. And your goal is to act before they get the MCP joint hyperextension. That's what you want to prevent. Okay, the last one I want to talk about is a lumbrical plus. And this is a paradoxical extension of the IP joints while the person's trying to flex their fingers. So they're trying to flex it, but the finger's going up, okay? I won't be rude and show you for the middle finger, okay? But if, that, if you want to remember it, it's kind of like giving someone the finger, all right? And that's the most common sight for it to occur is a middle finger. But I won't, I won't do that to the delegates because you'll start throwing things at me, okay? So what's the mechanism of this? Well, basically, go back to what I said in the biomechanics. FDP to three, four, and five, they share a common muscle belly. Um, and they can't independently flex two digits without pulling on the third, okay? Does that make sense so far? All right. The index, however, has an independent FDP belly, okay? So what it means is when you try and grip an object or you try and form a fist, one digit will stick out or get caught in your clothes. So for example, someone might try and grab a can of Coke and a digit will basically stick out, okay? And the mechanism is because the FDP has been disrupted distal to the origin of the lumbricals. So that's the reason why you get this, okay? So it means some sort of transection or avulsion of the FDP, but distal to where it's given off the lumbricals. Because remember, the lumbricals come off the FDP, 
okay? Or it might be that you've amputated the DIP joint or you've used a tendon graft, which is too long. So what that means is if you've got a laceration of the FDP, okay, when you try and flex your fingers, when you try and contract the FDP, it will send a signal to the lumbricals, okay? Because remember, the lumbricals flex your IP joints and they originate from the FDP. The lumbricals will then pull on the lateral bands and that will cause your PIP joint and DIP joint to be extended paradoxically. Does that make sense? Yeah, because your lumbricals are extending these things, all right? So it's an injury distal to the origin of the lumbricals being given off. And that causes a lumbrical fing plus finger. You try and flex, but one of the fingers is extended. Okay. Slight thing to remember, guys, is so just remember the first and second lumbricals. This is a bit more complex. I'll, I'll just touch on this. The first and second lumbricals, which is supplied by the median nerve, they're unipennate. They have one muscle belly and they originate from the radial side of FDP2. In in the case of the first, or FDP3 in the case of the second. The third and fourth lumbricals, okay, that supply the wing and little finger, they're bipennate. They've got two bellies, okay? So first and second are unipennate, one belly. Third and fourth, bipennate, two bellies, okay? The third lumbricle basically originates from FDP3 and 4, and the fourth lumbricle originates from FDP4 and 5. Have I still got you at the moment? You still understand that at the moment, okay? So all it means is it comes from two, whereas one and two just come from one. And so what that means is that's important because if you cut the FDP to the middle finger, okay, the FDP will shift in an ulnar direction because it's being pulled by another one. Does that make sense? Yeah, because it's like a seesaw, both are pulling on it, all right? So how would you treat this? You can tina dees the FDP to the terminal tendon, or you can reinsert it into the distal phalanx if there's a laceration, basically. Or if the FDP is retracted and you can't fix it, you can do a lumbrical release, okay, to get rid of that sort of extensor tone. You do not transect the lumbricals one and two if they've also got an ulnar nerve palsy. That's the key thing. So the final thing I want to quickly go through, are we okay for start time, sorry? I'm just going to be five minutes for, sorry, I've run us slightly over, okay? Is basically biomechanics to the wrist and carpus, okay? And the way to think about this is two main rows, all right? The distal row is this one here, and the distal row is relatively rigid, whereas the proximal is more mobile, okay? The proximal's got no tendon attachments. It's relatively mobile, and it's often referred to as an intercalated segment because it sits between the distal radius and ulna and the distal row, okay? And this is where you come on to where you were mentioning before, I'm not sure how to pick up injuries. It's looking at these two rows, okay? So what are your theories for how the carpus moves? We don't actually know, but there's lots of different theories. The first is the link theory. And the link theory basically imagines that the radius, lunate, and capitate are like a chain, okay? So you often see a lateral view on a radiograph, and people say it's like a cup and an apple in a saucer, essentially, okay? So radius, lunate, capitate are in a chain, and they think of this capitate as being the center of rotation. So that's the link theory of how the carpus moves. The next one is the row theory, which basically says that you've got two rows, a distal row, which is relatively fixed, a mobile row, which is relatively, um, mo sorry, mobile proximal row, relative, relatively mobile. And the scaphoid is the bridge across the two rows, okay? So that would be your scaphoid, lunate, and triquetrum, relatively mobile, and your distal row, trapezium, trapezoid, capitate, hame, relatively rigid. But the scaphoid is a connecting bridge, okay? And that's important, guys. Because if that, that theory, if that connection is broken in some ways, then you might get pathology. I'll come on to that in a second. The column theory basically states that there are three columns, okay? So it says that there's a medial or ulnar column, which you can't see very well on this picture here. But basically that's responsible for rotation and it consists of the triquetrum and distal carpal row. The central bit, this bit in red, is responsible for flexion and extension and that consists of the lunate, capitate and hamate and then the radial or lateral column consists of the scaphoid trapezium and trapezoid where the center of rotation is the scaphoid and that's relatively mobile and that kind of explains why we see stt arthritis this column theory because those three kind of go together okay
So how is this wrist stabilized? We've talked about how it moves, but how is it actually stabilized? Well, think about extrinsic ligaments that run from the radius or ulna to the carpus and intrinsic ligaments that run between the carpal ligaments. And the extrinsic ligaments can be broken up into the vola, which are the stronger ones, or the dorsal ones, which are relatively weak, okay? The dorsal, weaker, I should say, they're not weak, but they're weaker. The vola ones are stronger, okay? So basically, let's start with the, I'll come on to the dorsal in a second, let's start with the volar ones, the stronger ones. You've got the radioscapholunate ligaments, okay, you've got the long and short radiolunate ligaments, you've got the ulnocapitate ligaments, and you've got the radial collateral ligaments. And you may be asked those probably in part one, okay. The key point is the apex of these ligaments is on either the capitate or lunate. Radioscaphoid runs from the radius to the capitate and wraps around the scaphoid, whereas radial collateral runs from the radius to the scaphoid. Okay. You've got the extrinsic or dorsal ligaments, and these basically run from the radius to the distal carpal bones in a distal ulnar direction. And there's the radioscaphoid, radiolunate, radiotriquetral, and dorsal intercarpal. What do I want you guys to know for the exam? I want you to know that basically this, these are sort of arranged as two Vs, okay? So the dorsal is one V and the volar is another V, okay? So that's the way to think of it. There's two Vs, okay? And that's important, guys, because when you do a dorsal approach to the carpus, we try and preserve these ligaments by basically doing a trapezoidal type retinacular flap, which you may have all heard of, called a Burgers flap. You guys heard of that, yeah? And you're trying to preserve these ligaments. That's why you do a Burgers flap. Okay, so what's the relevance of this clinically? Well, the relevance is I've talked about there's these two Vs. Between the two Vs, there's a relative point of weakness, okay, which becomes more prominent in dorsiflexion and disappears in palmiflexion. And that is where the lunate can sometimes be dislocated into called the space of poirier okay and that's a common thing that comes up in the exam the intrinsic ligaments basically they are the ones between the carpal bones and they're tight in the distal row they're loose in the proximal row and the only ones i want you to know for the exam are the scaphalunate and lunotriquetral ligaments okay so the thing to remember guys this is my buzzword i use for the exam and i want you to remember it the lunate is a torque converter that's the way it works, buzzword, torque converter. It transmits a flexor force from the scaphoid and an extensor force from the triquetrum. So when you radially deviate or dorsiflex, the scaphoid will flex to get out of the way, to give you more movement. So the distal radius can directly contact the trapezium. When you ulnar deviate or flex, the scaphoid will extend. Does that make sense? So scaphoid flexes in that position, radial deviation, it extends in ulnar deviation. That's an important point to know. Okay, and the lunate will go with it normally. Okay, because of those intrinsic ligaments. So it's a torque converter. So that's what happens in normal anatomy. What happens when things go wrong? And I call that uncoupling. The chain is broken. So the lunate, the way to think of it is a seesaw. The lunate goes with the intact part of the chain, okay? So basically, if, and that will give rise to the instability after which it's named. So for example, in a scaphoid lunate injury or a scaphoid non-union, if the chain is broken, the lunate will go with the triquetrum because that's the intact part of the chain. So this time, when you radially deviate, the scaphoid will, what's gonna happen? The scaphoid will flex, but the lunate will extend. So as a result, the scaphal lunate angle will become bigger, giving rise to a dissy deformity. Scaphal lunate angle greater than 60 degrees. Easy, you don't have to memorize this, you can work it out, okay? Opposite side, if you get a lunar triquetral and a radio triquetral dorsal ligament injury, this time you've got no extensor force. So this time what happens is basically the scaphal lunate angle goes down and you get a vissy deformity. That's all that's happened. It's going with the intact part of the chain. So this time the lunate will go with the scaphoid rather than going with the triquetrum. Okay, and then final thing to say is wrist motions, you've got flexion, extension, radial ulnar deviation, and the main functional movement of the wrist, I want you to remember for the exam, is dart thrower's motion, which is a composite movement consisting of radial deviation and dorsiflexion going to palmar um, deviation and ulnar flexion.
sorry. No, no, so dorsal, so extension and radial deviation goes to flexion ulnar deviation. That's what dart throws motion is. So that's the main functional motion in the wrist. Last thing I'm going to touch on, I'm just going to mention it. There's four types of instability that you see in the hand of wrist. CID, which is carpal instability dissociative. CIND, which is carpal instability non-dissociative. CIA, which is carpal instability adaptive. And CIC, which is complex. Carpal instability dissociative is the one that I've just mentioned, where you get a break in the chain, leading to a dis or a vis -y. Carpal instability non-dissociative is this time where you get instability between the rows, okay? So either radiocarpal between the radius and the proximal row or mid-carpal between the proximal and distal row. Carpal instability adaptive is where some sort of problem outside the wrist causes a carpal malalignment. So for example, a malunion from a distal radius fracture causes a compensatory carpal malalignment. It adapts. And finally, carpal instability complex is your so-called lunate and perilunate dislocation, which is kind of a mixture of all of them. Thank you, guys. Sorry, I went slightly over there. Great. How is it? Hand Hi. Hi. Do you have any questions for Rishi? Yeah, Rishi. Uh, Rishi, 